In a recent video, I presented a demonstration of the legendary master Guolingying Standao form. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the details and essentials of his style and form. The term Dandao refers to a category of weapons that have a single edge uh, blade. And for the purposes in this video and for Sisu's curriculum, the Dandao refers to the single edge saber, which looks like, like this, with a slightly curved blade and edge on one side and um, coming to a point. Um, the Dandao also can include a uh, broadsword and a host of other weapons, but for this purpose, uh, we'll be talking about the single edged saber. In the morning, Sifu would have his students take out the weapons, and on the weapons that uh, Sifu taught, they were laid out on the bench in Portion Square, and uh, they included the staff, the double edged sword, the Tai Chi sword, the Jin, and um, the Dandao. And those were the weapons that he taught. The students didn't have to have their own weapons. They could use the weapons that uh, Sifu put out on the bench for practice. One of the rules was you weren't supposed to touch the weapons unless you were actually um, uh, a student of the weapon. So you couldn't just go and play with the weapons or anything like that. Only if you were um, you know, entitled to studying the form could you actually go and pick up the weapon and, and uh, practice with them. So, um, one of the things I like to um, think about is the fact that Sifu came from a period where the Dandao, the single edged saber, was actually a weapon. Um, you know, he was born in 1895, and so when he was in his probably mid life, uh, around 25, 30, working on a camel caravan in the desert, he probably carried a uh, broadsword, a Dandao, single edged saber. Uh, as for use as a weapon. And so, um, as compared to uh, the fancier Wushu forms, his form is much more foundational. Characteristics of his form is it doesn't have all the fancy twirling and, and uh, butterfly movements that uh, fancier Wushu uh, weapons do. And the second thing is that the weapon that uh, is the single edged saber has a firm blade to it, a very traditional. In today's competition forms, the criteria for the firm blade is that it must support its weight when on the tip. So, like that. The reason for the flexibility of a lot of the Wushu uh, sabers is that so when you're performing some of the moves of Fajin, the, the blade will snap and make a sound, so they like that popping sound. But myself, I don't really like that whippy blade. It just kind of like moves around too much. And so I prefer the firm blade. Um, the weight of this uh, saber can range anywhere from uh, one and a half to about even four pounds. So, uh, This is a saber that uh, Sifu brought back for me from China. And this one is uh, heavier. This one is about 2.2 .2 pounds. So, um, this one has a uh, particular significance to me uh, because the Sandao was a, well, let's put it this way. When Bing celebrate his 10 years celebration, Bing Gong, my senior um, Kung Fu brother, finally reached 10 years of uh, dedicated practice, Sifu held a celebration for him. And in the celebration, Sifu had me go and purchase a sword for Bing, it was a Dan Dao, and present it to him as a commemorative gift. And so there was a significance in the presentation of Sifu giving Bing Gong the Dan Dao. And many years later, when um, I asked Sifu for permission to teach, um, when he came back from China, he called me in one day and he presented me with this Dandao, kind of as a commemorative of uh, his granting me permission to teach. So this particular Dandao is probably 
my most uh, treasured possession. And so uh, I've retired it a little bit and gone on to uh, kind of a lighter weight copper standout. So uh, this is a dandao that I use currently. In um, Sifu's style, the one of his characteristics of the uh, his style is the wrap. We call this the wrap when you do the slice, and then this is like a blocking your back coming down. In the traditional uh, wrap in most uh, many styles, the wrap goes like this: comes the slice, the vertical block comes down over the shoulder and into this uh, this position. So slice like that. In Sifu style of the wrap, it varies a little bit because um, he has a continuous walking um, wrap, which looks like this. Like that. So on this particular wrap, the blade, instead of coming down over the shoulder and into this uh, guard position, comes down like that. So it comes slice and it comes to the back and then the tip is kind of a pivoting point and then it comes down here so that you can do continue, continuous slicing. So that's a fairly unique part of his uh, Dandao style. Another characteristic of his style is that Sifu did not use a flag or tassels on any of his weapons. There is one photo in the studio of Sifu with a double Tai Chi sword, with double straight swords with tassels on them, but I'm pretty sure that was just for the, the photograph uh, because in all the practice weapons, there were no um, flags or uh, tassels. The flag in the wushu is just so you can see the weapon better, it's flashier, and also supposedly the flag, if it was used, would be to just more distract the opponent in trying to follow the flag or the blade. But in Sifu style, we did not use a, a flag at all. Um, if you're just coming to practice the Dandao and you're following some of my previous Dandao lessons uh, where I was trying to teach a young student um, the, the Wushu form and I was teaching some basic Dandao movements for her to uh, pick up so she could play with the Dandao that she receives as a gift, um, that comes in the Wushu uh, practice. And um, I have used the flag before. I like the flag. But um, now that I've gone back to teaching uh, more specifically Sifu Guo's um, style, I've uh, taken the flags off my weapons and gone back to traditional. Um, of course, the, his Dandao comes from his Shaolin side, not the Guanqing Tai Chi side. And you can see that in the stance work here in this uh, one series of movements. We're in the bow stance, and then you're in the cat stance, and then into the falling stance, back into the bow stance. So it definitely comes from the Northern Shaolin curriculum. And in um, the progression of the student's curriculum, if you were studying the Northern Shaolin, you would go, uh, you would study the Tantwe, which uh, 10 rows first for your foundation. And then after Tan Tui, you progress into that uh, video that I showed of the second form of Sifu Go's Northern Shaolin Cha Chuan. And from the Cha Chuan, then you could actually choose to go into uh, the Dandao, practice the single red saber and learn that form. Or you could go into the third form of Northern Shaolin Arlong. And so I'd say about mm, half the students of the Northern Shaolin, uh, when it, it went from the Chachuan into the Saber, and probably another half went into going from Chachuan to the third 
Northern Shaolin, bare hands form, or long. So um, it wasn't a, the saber was uh, really not taught to a lot of students, which again, you had to go through the Northern Shaolin curriculum. And so a lot of students now that uh, practice at Dan Dao came from uh, other students, uh, like Ding Gong, Colorado students um, at Dan Dao. Within the Portland Square, there was just a limited amount of people I remember doing the Dan Dao. And so the Dan Dao, again, uh, I was talking about the sword that Sifu presented to me. When I asked Sifu if I could um, teach, he told Bing that I had to come and study with him directly for a few years until he decided I was ready. And uh, when I came to him, I already knew the Chakwan. So Sifu decided that he wanted to teach me the Dan Dao as a way of uh, interacting, as a way of seeing my dedication and seeing my knowledge. So the Dandao was the form that he and I worked on during that time where he was kind of evaluating for uh, granting me permission to teach. And I would um, have to make this long trip on the weekends. I was living in Sonoma County and I have to drive two hours from Sonoma County to the Bay Area. I had to get there by five o'clock, so we'd leave the house about three, three thirty in the morning and arrive around at Portsmouth at five in the morning. And many times people would immediately, you know, we'd see me driving up, tell somebody to come and grab me and he would have me uh, do a demonstration for him of what I was practicing and doing to test me. And of course he told me that um, if you are studying a weapon or your hands form. You have to be able to perform it without warming up. So I couldn't warm up. I just had to do it. And that would determine whether I would learn a new move that day or for the next week or the next month. Uh, Sisu was a old school teacher and there was no guarantee of learning a move every time that you went and studied with him. So I think that Dandao took me about maybe a year to learn. It was a progression was slow. It was very kind of painstaking, but um, uh, so I got through the whole form and he granted me permission to teach. So that's the significance of the Dandao to me and it's a fairly important form to me. Um, in learning uh, the rap, I will present that in a separate lesson. So, um, so that's about it just for today. It's the essentials of uh, Master Golding and Dandao.